Hello everyone, my name is David Robson, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's screening of Akira Kurosawa's 1952 film, Ikiru. My pleasure because it is a humanist masterpiece and one of the greatest movies ever made. The protagonist of the film is Watanabe, a bureaucrat in Japan's civil service who visibly carries the toll of 30 years in the service of faceless administration. When his doctor informs him that he has only months to live, Watanabe is faced with how little he has accomplished during his life. He eventually settles on completing a project that he himself helped stall out, and devotes his remaining days to the approval and construction of a children's playground in a underserved and blighted section of town. Uh, and a little history on the movie. In 1951, the year before Ikiru's release, uh, Kurosawa's film Rashomon won the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Film Festival. It was the first Japanese film to win the honor, and the award opened the eyes of the rest of the world to Japanese cinema in general, and Kurosawa and his explosively charismatic Rashomon star Toshiro Mifune in particular. Though Kurosawa's 16 films with uh, Toshiro Mifune are his best-known partnership, Takashi Shimura, who plays Watanabe, had a longer association, appearing in 21 of Kurosawa's films. It's worth considering the differences between the actors here because it speaks in part to what makes Ikiru stand out in Kurosawa's work. Mifune is powerfully expressive, and he's known for his violent physicality. Uh, naturally, this lent robustness and power to the action-oriented movies such as Seven Samurai, uh, Yojimbo, and The Hidden Fortress that, for many viewers, are Kurosawa's most familiar works. That intensity also spoke to a suppressed rage that Kurosawa sensed within the spirit of his country, and Kurosawa would often use the violence of Mifune's characters to act out some of his own frustrations with aspects of society that he was addressing in his films. That intensity would not be the correct tool to apply to the role of an afflicted bureaucrat. Uh, where Mifune is all earth and fire, Shimura might be considered air and water. When we meet Watanabe, he seems to be completely caught in the flow, uh, heading helplessly downward towards his end. In his finest moments, after he has found his purpose uh, and something larger than himself to fight for, uh, he seems to fly. And even when we, we see his health failing, you can sense uh, a man fighting to live, to stay breathing. In playing a character older and more infirm than himself, Shimura reveals an act for physical acting that is quite different from Mifune's, but no less impressive. His performance as Watanabe is an embodiment in which many younger viewers of the movie have seen their elderly relatives, and in which many older viewers cannot help but see ourselves. Last bit on Mifune. I feel like in all of Mifune's work with Kurosawa there is that shot. Uh, someone says something inflammatory or stupid, you know, laying down a challenge, and Kurosawa cuts to the back of Mifune's head, and Mifune turns around, and his face filled the screen as it widens into a scowl that builds into absolute incandescent rage, and you just know that it's on. There is that shot in Ikiru, but the energy that Shimura unleashes into the camera when he turns is quite different from that of Mifune. It's just a little something to look for. Stylistically, the movie is very much of a piece with Kurosawa's other work. Uh, he's one of the best filmmakers for blocking the arrangements of bodies in space and in the frame, and that knack serves him very well here. Consider how the camera frames Watanabe over the course of the movie, how at his weak moments he seems dwarfed and consumed by the world around him, uh, particularly the stacks and stacks of paper in his office. Compare those moments to the luminous close-ups he gets during his more triumphant moments later in the film. Kurosawa's command of setting is particularly strong. Uh, Ikiru shares with his contemporary films the sense of weather in Japan's cities. Uh, these cities get very hot in the summer, and are absolutely freezing during the winter, and watching the movie, even on a screen you know, this size, you can practically feel that heat uh, and that cold. You match all of that with the not showy but very determined mobility of Kurosawa's camera, and you have a film uh, that looks like no one else's. The movie is as vibrant in its form as in its style. Uh, the movie splits into two halves, and the first tracks Watanabe through his days before and immediately after his diagnosis. It's very straightforward, it's brutally linear as we follow him pursuing various options open to him in his final days. We then abruptly cut forward in time to Watanabe's wake, and the second half of the movie tells its story largely in flashback, much as Rashomon does, as the assembled mourners get drunk and share the reflections of Watanabe as they piece together his last weeks and try and figure out the root of his dogged determination to build that playground. 
Both acts climax with Watanabe singing uh, Gondola no Uta, a traditional Japanese song known in English as Life is Brief. At the end of the first act, the song registers as a sad statement of resignation to a pained but understanding loss of everything. At the climax of the second half, Watanabe's performance of the song is nothing less than cosmic. The themes that fuel the story of Ikiru are remarkably timely in part because they are so universal. The central questions, you know, you can infer from what I've already told you. What are we living our lives for? Why ultimately are we here? What will ultimately remain of us after we've gone? Any thinking, feeling human being has given these questions some consideration. I would add to these a question that Kurosawa claimed to be exploring in all of his work. The question of why can't we be happier and why can't we be happier together? He doesn't place this question directly in the mouth of one of his characters or give us a quick and easy answer. He's too much of an artist for that. But I believe that the question is, is something he's considering in the movie's savage and satirical attack on Japanese society and social mores. Now, early in the film, we experience the treatment of Watanabe by his patronizing physician. Uh, there are certain serious health issues that do not get discussed in Japan's codedly polite society. The silence that that society has erected around uh, Watanabe's condition is possibly the most brutal thing about it. We see very clearly the effect that isolation, the isolation that silence has on Watanabe, how the silence exacerbates the already painful non-communication between Watanabe and his son, and that silence is a major sticking point with the mourners at his wake. That silence is so internalized that they struggle to find a reason for it or even words to describe it. That the movie begins with an x-ray of our afflicted protagonist and a narrator telling us with a bluntness that is startling even now that what afflicts Watanabe is fatal and will kill him shortly is a very uncodedly, very directly impolite gesture that is so strong as to be downright punk rock. And Kurosawa does not stop there. Uh, the movie takes in the lingering presence of the post-war American occupation, an aspect that Kurosawa has examined in earlier films, uh, most crucially Stray Dog. The American colonization of other countries as an occupying presence continues today, uh, particularly insidiously through our popular culture. The presence of American popular songs uh, throughout Ikiru feels the sense of a certain coarseness in aspects of Japanese society, and it adds an ambiguity even to the otherwise exultant appearance of Mildred and Patty Hill's Happy Birthday to You at a key, birth a key point in the film. The juxtaposition of such music with the simple uh, yet deeply emotional strains of Gondola no Uta is striking. More striking still is the movie's central attack on the useless and needlessly complicated bureaucracy within which Watanabe works and under which everyone else trudges unhappily along. The movie painstakingly depicts the processes by which such organizations pass the buck and avoid their responsibilities to the citizens they are ostensibly there to serve. Uh, the film also captures the communa communality felt when citizens work together to motivate such agencies to work on their behalf. We have come through the last 14 months under COVID-19 and experienced both of these extremes, with governments indifferent to the point of lethality on one end, and governments working to immunize their citizens, and citizens taking the res responsibility to get themselves immunized. So these aspects of Ikiru are particularly resonant uh, to those of us watching today. That so many of our fellow citizens are refusing the vaccine and that governments remain in conflict over the pandemic wouldn't surprise Kurosawa. And that brings me to the final thing I want to discuss. In the end, uh, those in Watanabe's orbit pledge that they will follow his example, yet we see them hesitate to put that impulse into action. As uplifting and deeply moving as the film is, many take this aspect to heart and declare the film pessimistic. A movie, of course, can be all of these things. One might state dourly that Kurosawa isn't a pessimist, uh, but a realist. I would argue instead that he is a humanist. There are aspects of humanity that Kurosawa simply accepts. The characters in Ikiru are lazy, ambitious, task-oriented, insensitive, ignorant, too focused on the wrong things, and in the end unredeemed, but they are humans, they are not villains. To make them villains would be a sentimental gesture. And despite what it's about, Ikiru is not a sentimental film. The emotions it evokes in us, it earns. It moves us by the weight and grace of Watanabe's example, but it does not moralize or nag us to follow in his footsteps. It recognizes and accepts that, like those Watanabe leaves behind, it is in our nature to hesitate at the threshold of an open door. 
But the true greatness of Ikiru lies in that it holds the door open, and it reminds us that the bounty and grace beyond remain well within our reach. I'm very excited to watch this movie with you, and I will be present throughout uh, if you have anything uh, you want to add in the chat window. Thank you very much for watching.